Next month, we're coming back to a hybrid meeting in the library, hooray. Uh, and we're all looking forward to Tuesday topics and to Lisa Staley helping us with this hybrid meeting. Our speaker will be Jimena Garcia. Um, she'd been a member of the league for a while, uh, a public health uh, physician advisor to the governor, uh, talking about public health in Kansas and how it, uh, COVID has affected us. Um, a, a quick announcement that uh, our lead member, Vicki Arnett, is serving on the City of Topeka Redistricting Commission. She reminded us that they're gonna start their meetings this week. She'll keep us updated, but the city of Topeka has put together a nice um, website where you can see what's happening with that redistricting commission that will affect us right here where our boots are on the ground in Topeka. Um, and even though some of them aren't here, we have quite a few poll workers that are league members today. And a lot of people have put in a lot of time going to tabling events and, and working to prepare for the primary. So just thanks to all of us, kudos to ourselves for all the work that we put in. And uh, maybe we'll have a, a day to a um, little day of rest tomorrow. And then we're going to get right back on that horse and start working for the general election in November. So. We're so excited uh, to have our present presentation today. She is a researcher and public historian. She says she is a woo shock uh, and has a master's degree in history from Wichita State University. Uh, she's done a lot of work about redlining in Topeka in particular and how it has affected our community. Recently, that was chosen to be part of the Humanities Kansas Speakers Bureau. Uh, she does consulting work, uh, has included conducting focus groups in the African American community for the State Historical Society across the state as part of the project they have on engaging communities. Uh, she serves on a number of various panels, boards, and commissions, um, and is a historian with the uh, Topeka Shawnee County Public Library. So uh, no further ado, I'm just really happy to introduce Donna Ray Pearson. Donna. All right, well, thank you, Carol, and thank you to the League for having me here today. Um, I do, now this presentation, I keep getting asked to do it in shorter and shorter amounts of time. So I'm just gonna kind of barrel through this and you know, I'm down at 23 slides, so hopefully, Hopefully, I will get this done in the right amount of time. And I, and but as part of that, I decided the best way to do that is just to keep it simple. There are some complex things that we're going to go through, but um, I'm going to do a little mini case study of Topeka, the why, the how, and the consequences of redlining. Um, so, but first, what I like to do is, oh, see, technology is a beautiful thing, I think. Um, can you guys see what looks like the American Dream game? Yes. I can't see you, so you just have to, I don't yes. know. Someone's... We can see it. Yes. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, Lisa. So right now where we are is, you know, after slavery, you kind of go around and jog around and there's redlining. So it's, um, after segregation, but before the civil rights area, this is the kind of time frame that we're going to be working in. Okay. All right. Um, so let's just start with the basic definition of what redlining is. Um, it's the practice of denying fair access to credit, particularly mortgages based on the race of residents of a neighborhood. Um, the title slide in the home loans corporation maps are the physical manifestation of the practice of redlining that began in the 1930s. In a bit, I will tell you more about how those maps came to being and the impact that they had in Topeka. Uh, the side note is, you know, there are alternate definitions of how we use the words redlining. So, um, but it's basically a person experiencing discrimination which is what that says there. And I think I, 
there we go. Um, some of the consequences of historic redlining are disparities in wealth, food security, health matters, and education. Now, if you want to talk about specific examples during the discussion session, we can certainly do that. But in general, I know that about 60% of Topeka's residents live in a food desert. I do know even in the land of Brown versus Board, there are still educational disparities. And when you overlay historic maps with current NIA maps, these are still reflect red line districts. You can see all of this, but Let's take a quick comparison. And um, so when you look at this, that red line map was created in 1938. It's a risk map. And again, I will get into a little bit more about how they cre were created. But when you look at the 2020 health map, neighborhood health map, upper in the upper right hand corner, and then there's also another one from 2017 in the lower corner. And then the neighborhood revitalization map on the left-hand side. What I call it is in the red line map, you see that red terrier, that pink terrier? It looks like a Scottish terrier set. Do you guys got that and see it? I can't see you. Yes. So. I'm going to, okay, thank you. So when you flip over to 2017, that Scottish terrier is still there. Now it is getting a little more blue, but then again, it's not quite there, um, but you still see this. So the red line communities that were created in, the 19, in 1938, they're still persistent today. Okay, so uh, that is the first thing that you, you have to be, aware of and be clear of that um, even though health rating is based on five indicators of the neighborhood, poverty, public safety, average residential property, homeowner tenure, and boarded houses, the point of the areas is to identify that are identified again almost 84 years ago, this is what was created. So let's go ahead and dig into why it happened. All right. Um, the Topeka backstory. Now I feel like I'm going to, it's going to feel like I'm going off topic a little bit, I think, but I think understanding this backstory really makes a huge difference um, because this was not an isolated one-time deal. There is a system that was created and allowed to flourish and take hold. Uh, to make it even worse, it was government as well as private sponsored. So the first thing I need to remind you is that the Civil Rights Act of the US was on the book since 1866. They were tied to the Reconstruction Amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th. But man, did they have a whole lot of loopholes and 150 years later guaranteed, you know, they were supposed to guarantee basic rights in America. I bring this all up to say that most of what I'm talking about happened while there were laws in the books to prevent this. Um, when we're talking about government, this is basically government sponsored di di discrimination, excuse me. Uh, it was illegal and the powers that be that continually created these situations allowed it to happen. So I also like to tell people at this point or some point in this presentation that there are no white saviors in my stories for the most part as an African-American historian in Kansas. Um, I'm here to provide you with a different perspective of how things happen. So, you know, this, this is, some people feel this presentation is a little direct, but I think it's necessary. Um, so let's talk about first who was involved. So the Black and the Mexican American settlement in Topeka, um, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this. I just want you to understand where the different enclaves occurred. So in North Topeka, we're talking about a neighborhood called the Sands or Jordan Town. The Bottoms, which will be the real focus of this discussion, um, is just right off of downtown. Um, Oakland neighborhood is primarily where the Mexican-American community settled. And Tennessee town, um, it was just off of downtown, a little bit out of town. It still exists today. 
Mudtown is the area that is around, oops, sorry. Mudtown is the area around Brown versus Board. So, um, you know, this, let's see. Yeah, so according to Jose Garcia, who pinned the history in, of the Mexican community in 1973, they, like everyone else, came for different work opportunities. Um, and they settled around Santa Fe, the Santa Fe tracks near Hancock and Klein. Um, the settlement was picked up and then it was moved near Sixth and Shunga and nicknamed Little Mexico. Um, workers in both racial categories had pretty much had many old jobs, um, but this was their neighborhood. They were beginning to create their own communities. There were schools, there were churches, there were businesses, uh, restaurants, everything within these neighborhoods was available to those who lived within those neighborhoods. So about 1930, there were about 5,756 Blacks and about 1,700 Mexicans living in the neighborhood, okay, in these neighborhoods. So um, it's like, huh, who's he? Yeah, this is my, 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 my dude, Har Harlan. Harlan Bartholomew, um, you know, it was a city planner. Since ancient times, really, there's always been some type of city planning. The need for everything to be in a place within a city began to emerge in, as a profession in the U.S. in the late, um, early, the late to early 1900s. Before then, if you didn't know, cities were pretty chaotic places. You know, you could have a you can have a restaurant right next to an industrial factory, which is just up the street from a church. So city planning help us, helped us create spaces and places. Um, in part, and that was called the City Beautiful Movement or the Garden Movement. You know, we wanted to lay out streets beautifully. We needed to have green spaces here or um, this area was just for people to live. So. Harlan was actually one of the first full-time um, city planners in the United States. He was hired by Newark, New Jersey, and he came to, he went there about 1912 to help with the engineering firm to develop a comprehensive plan, which he, and he stayed on there for a little while. Um, he completed that plan in 1950. Then he went to St. Louis to set up shop. Um, and that's when he started connecting with folks in Kansas. Um, from in the early 1920s, he developed the first of what would be two different comprehensive plans for the city of Topeka. Uh, the first one was for about $6,000. I couldn't find a copy of that plan, but what I could gather from newspaper accounts is that it really was about zoning, making streets look good, um, and transforming downtown into more of a civic space. His, he and his team worked with the leadership of Topeka and they gave public presentations in an effort to sell, a, sell the plan. Um, those were their words, not mine. So, uh, but what, what happens after that? Well, as this city beautiful movement and city planning is occurring, Something happened in 1934, and it started, uh, it's basically sparked the suburbs, the creation of suburbs. President Fr Franklin Roosevelt signed the National Housing Act into law, um, and that law created the Federal Housing Administration. And this is where we get into a whole bunch of initials and letters. Uh, just don't focus on that so much. Just kind of focus on what they did. Um, and uh, so there is also the Federal Savings and Loan Insurance Corporation that was created as a broader attempt to revive the housing market during the Great Depression. So it used to be if you feel like loans are chaotic now, they were even worse back in the 1930s. You really didn't have much of an opportunity to actually pay off a house uh, the way interest rates in terms it was 
it was elevated contract for a D kind of situation that you really couldn't get out. So what the FHA did was standardize that 30 year loan, um, low interest mortgage to help increase home ownership. And it did, it went, it jumped up to almost 70%. And um, that is, that's, that was the bit, I think that's actually where the term started, you know, the American dream and the, you know, the thought of being able to own your home and your, your automobile and living in the suburbs. So that kind of originated from that area. So um, in 1935, what happened was the Federal Home Loan Bank Board, and we actually have one of these in our own backyard. You can thank Charles Curtis for that. Um, they commissioned the Homeowners Loan Corporation to appraise real estate risk in 239 cities. Um, so what these maps did, the homeowners loan corporation maps or the red line maps, or they're called risk maps, or you might also find them as security maps. There's several different terms for them. Um, they consistently graded people of color as well as low income neighbor neighborhoods as hazardous. Now, Tafika actually really did not try to hide that it was based on race. When you look at other cities and their descriptions of neighborhoods, they at least try to put other factors in it. You know, there's like, I don't know if you can see it, you'll be able to see it on the next screen. There's like this little area um, that they redline. And the only reason why they redline is because black people live there. There was like a group of four or five black people that lived on a block. So they redlined it, um, simple. Um, so, but the practice of redlining, what, what that did was um, it ended up because they were all of a sudden at risk, they could no longer get mortgages for their houses. Um, so their credit worthiness was basically based on the color of their skin and the neighborhood that they lived in versus their actual ability to repay the loan. So, you know, in history, this is this is what we call a pivotal moment. This is when there are choices that can be made. And, you know, then from those choices, there are chain reaction that happens. Um, the consequences can be viewed from a multiple different perspectives. That's what history is all about, is being able to join those multiple dis different perspectives and come up with a story. But, um, in this case, it's pretty clear that one map, you know, this one map generated for Topeka had a long lasting impact. Uh, the designation grades of security shown were determined basically by six men. Um, and I don't know their race. I've not seen a picture, not that I've, I've looked for, but not have, have never found a picture for them. All of their occupations were associated with loan companies or real estate firms. Um, there was only one of them that was from out of town. So these were people that lived in the city and they basically went around to different neighborhoods and decided if it was gonna be an A, B, C, or D. And when you look over to the left-hand side and you see the designations, when you add C and D together, almost 75% of Topeka was a, a, on the downhill side. It wasn't, basically they were saying 75% of Topeka is not worth investing in. At that time, at that point in time, that um, this is basically what that map says to a uh, a mortgage company, a, a bank. Um, so, yeah, it's you know, and and they evaluated it on again several different factors, but the primary one was race, um, the income level of the people there, and um, also if there was what type or what lack of amenities were in that neighborhood. So, um, you know, Harlan came back again with, with, with the comprehensive plan number two. Um, and I'm pretty sure Harlan 
use the, the risk maps to create his second city plan in the 1940s. Now this plan focused more on creating areas of living to be and being sure that Topeka had the highest possible tax income from various sources. So as you can see in some of his, his quotes, he is using the words, he is directly using the words Negroes or Mexican Americans, but he's also using the word blight, um, that this area is not up to, to standards. So this second plan was published in 1945 for $2 a copy. The city paid almost $19,000 to have this plan done. Um, and but that was back in the 1940s. When you look at the value of that in today's money, that's almost it's a, almost three hundred thousand dollars, or a little over three hundred thousand um, dollars. And that's a lot of money, you know, for to create a city plan. I don't know how much they pay for plans now, but geez, that seems like a lot. Um, but uh, when you read information about Harland, his background, he's actually accused of being a racist. Um, and when you look at the language that he uses in the plan, um, it would seem to support that as well. So, but remember I said, you know, this wasn't just um, the city doing this. There was also private concerns. So uh, I, I actually found out there is still a Topeka Realtors Board that is part of the Chamber of Commerce. Um, and I would still love to be able to get my hands on their records. They are based, from what I can tell, they were basically involved in boosterism to get people. And they were actually deciding what kind of people they wanted to have live in Topeka. I know you can't see it, so I'm going to read the living in Topeka for you um, and how they describe the Topeka, what they're looking for in the, the typical the typical Topekan, which is representing about 85 of the city's population, is native born white, probably descended from New England ancestry. He belongs to one of the of Topeka's 112 churches or yeah, or church organizations, and is justifiably proud of the city's 342 acres of parks. So when you hear that, when I read that, it's like, I don't see any space for anybody else to, they weren't asking minority people to come live here. They were looking for a specific type of people. And, you know, and once they got here, they wanted to make sure they live, were able to live in a specific type of neighborhood. So the handbill on the right hand side, the Westwood District, addition, I believe you can see it. It says a restricted subdivision for homes in Southwest Topeka. Now, unless you're familiar with the terms, um, restricted is referring to the actual deed itself and the language in the deed as to who can live there. So they're already promising up front that this is probably going to be one of those neighborhoods that is targeted for those 85% of the native born New England ancestry people, um, that that is who they want to live in this community. So, um, yeah. So, but um, does anyone, well, I can't ask a question because I can't see you. Anyway, Topeka, you know, but this is a problem because Topeka is, has had rises and falls in population. So Ford's Field, you know, is one of those places where it you thought it was housing for all, but actually most of that kind of governmental, that low income, that public housing originally was directed just for white people. Um, black people, again, were not taking supposed to be part of that plan. So if you can see kind of what is going on here, 
you already live in, if you're a minority, you already live in a red line neighborhood. You can't get a money to move out of this red line neighborhood. And even if you could get money, there are places that you will not be able to buy because um, they don't want you there. So now what tended to happen, so when you, so when you go around and see some of the different neighborhoods in, in Topeka, I call them, I and probably this is probably I probably need to come up with a better term. I don't know what it is yet. I call them Frankenstein houses because you know they start with one little house and then as time grows over, they're able to add on a little bit more because the family grew or they needed some additional income. So there's more and more spaces just kind of being added on. And it's because they couldn't go. They couldn't go buy a newer house someplace else. Um and what tended to happen in the Mexican-American community, they did more intergenerational living together. So they all stayed together that way. Um, so right now we're at the late 1940s, the early 50s. There were some crowded conditions in some parts of the city and the other parts of the city, there was well manicured lawns and, and sidewalks. So, and that's not just our city, that was across the nation. So the federal government came up with a program that is known today, we know today as urban renewal. Um, now, what most people don't realize, um, urban renewal is, I'm, I'm gonna go over this super briefly. The Housing Act of 1949 was part of President Truman's Fair Deal Initiative and they allocated funding to improve housing in urban areas. Let me say that again. It was not to go in wholesale and tear down houses. They were supposed to be getting this money to improve the houses that were considered blighted. They weren't considered up to living standards. Um, but really what ended up happening is that, well, that's not what happened. And then the second thing that happened was the, oops, uh-oh. Can you see me now? There we go. Um, the Federal Highway Act, which, you know, we're, we're, we're dealing with the legacy of that right now as well. So, um, so I'm going to talk about the urban renewal projects in Topeka. There was, the, it was the primary one where they really just, it was just bad, y'all, um, was the Keyway Project. Again, it was supposed to be about providing better quality housing, not only in Topeka, but across the nation. But for some reason, the, the promoters, the boosters, the government decided this was their chance to create new and better downtowns, almost 100% across the board. That was ended, kind of what ended up happening. Um, the Topeka leadership knew the urban renewal program was going to happen in their town even before it, they actually had approval. The, at the press conference held at the Jayhawk Hotel, the newly formed Topeka Urban Renewal Agency announced the first project. It was going to be a 37 block area identified, included downtown in an adjacent neighborhood. 60% of the identified area was residential. Um, but Harry Beecroft also stated not to form any conclusions prior to the approval of the city commission and the study that must be conducted. So they were already making announcements that this was gonna happen before they had even crossed their I's, or dotted their I's or crossed their T's yet. Um, and they really did a good job. They did an excellent job of hyping this up in the media. Uh, you can find so many new articles. And the biggest word that they loved using was the word blight, you know? So there are people living here um, that live in their living conditions might not be the same as the ones on the other side of town, but blight was the catchphrase, the key word, um, that they typically use. Now, if you look at this map and remember where the settlements were, you realize that this was an early settlement known as the bottoms. 
So this neighborhood consisted of African-American, especially Mexican-Americans, as well as I found out this weekend because I'm working on another project related to the bottoms, Native Americans. And someone said they even saw some Asians there. So, um, you know, on the far left-hand side, that is called Lytle's Drugstore. Um, the bulldozer came in sometime after November 1963. It destroyed the building and brought an abrupt end to the 80-year run of the Lytle family, an African-American family operating businesses downtown. Charles C. Lytle was forced to shut his doors um, that year. He had been caught, you know, he actually decided to sue the URA and he actually won. He was compensated uh, he, for $25,000. Um, but that wasn't enough for him to buy his way into another neighborhood. He stated the reason, part of the reason why he did not um, relocate his, build, his business is because there were, he could not find a suitable business location that someone would actually sell to him. So I believe the Lytles were the oldest Black business operating in downtown in the 1960s. And when you look at the length of Black businesses, the ones, you know, some people, well, churches are businesses. You do have your churches that are older, you know, well into the 100 years. And then all of a sudden you have this abrupt stop in Black businesses. Um, and they start, it starts back up again. Um, Bowser and Johnson is one of the oldest funeral homes. Um, but it stops pretty consistently and doesn't start up again until the early to mid 70s. So um, if, if you ever wonder why there aren't more Black businesses or where they are, it's because they were all taken out during urban renewal in this area called 4th Street, was the, which was the Black business district. Um, and it was, it was, it was a vibrant hub of work and life. Um, you know, it but urban renewal allowed several um, several movers and shakers in Topeka involved in businesses um, in mortgage and real estate companies and also businesses downtown to um, create a system, a setup that did not adequately compensate not only the businesses, so for, so for instance, if they didn't own, if the Black people did not own their building, they were given a, a much smaller amount to relocate someplace else. Um, if they own their own home, there was actually, there, Topeka basically forgot about the whole, we need to relocate them somewhere. So in a hurried effort, they try to create housing. And most of that ends, ends up being on the west side of town. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, not the west side of town, the east side of town and different housing projects, some of which still exist today. Okay. Um, there were two different lawsuits. The NAACP did try to sue. They lost. Um, the URA designated the 669 families would be relocated in um, so that's, that's not what the NAACP was looking for. What also, but there was also a group of white businessmen who, who sued and won. So that drastically changed the impact or the, the line of where urban renewal was going to happen in downtown. So, and it ended up being concentrated in the black neighborhood, in the bottoms neighborhood. We, we tried it again. Um, actually, there's people only tend to think of, talk about the Keyway project, but actually there were a total of three different urban renewal projects, two of them focused on downtown, and then the other one, the Highland Park Pierce project. We were actually trying to get it right. We're like, okay, we, we totally screwed up. We, we have created more of a mess than we actually realized. Um, the, the jury's still out. I haven't done an, enough research on Highland Park Pierce to decide whether it was successful or not. 
but in general, the few people that I have found that have been associated with that area say they still did not live up to expectations. The goal of urban renewal was to create a standard of living and make better housing options available. And they did not. It did get Minniger involved in this process. And again, that's something that needs to be researched a little bit more, but um, the impact of it all, so in conclusion, I think I'm kind of on time. Um, you know, what can one map do? Well, you know, first let's talk about downtown redevelopment. I serve on the local landmarks commission and have for at least the past six years. Um, when you consider there was a vibrant African-American neighborhood, um, mixed neighborhood uh, with businesses that were all taken out, um, you would that you would think there'd be some some options some some availability something <laughs> um, uh, of of people of color you know actually operating businesses downtown again I've been on the local landmarks commission for six years I've been on the planning commission for less than a year I've yet to see a person of color come before either one of these commissions. And say that again, I've yet to see a person of color come before any one of these commissions in terms of asking for assistance, saying they were investing in these areas. It's like they they locked the the door, you know, in 1963. Let's talk about generational wealth. In 1940, you had about a 50, 50 percent chance of owning your own home, whether you are black or white. Um, th this is a little off because they weren't counting the Mexican, Hispanic, Latino population the same way. They were counted as white. It's, it's complicated. Um, in general, this is pretty good when you consider the home ownership rate was about 51% in Kansas during this time period. When you look at 1970, all of a sudden overall home ownership shifts dramatically. Um, it, you're pretty much guaranteed to have the option of owning your own home if you're white. If you're Hispanic or Latino, your chances are going down, you know, a little bit, you know, a little bit more. Um, and, and again, even less if you're black. Um, and again, at this time, the home ownership rate is about 70%. So we're keeping track with the state, but not well. Um, when we talk, look at 2019, I will need to get this one updated. Again, um, your chances of owning a home are solidly tied to the fact you are white and you probably have the ability to buy a house wherever you would like to buy a house. Um, if you're black, it's dismal. I, I, can't, I can't imagine the fact that I am considered different or I don't know what the word is, but I am part of that small percentage of African-Americans in Topeka that actually owns my own home. And it's true. Most of the people I know who are black do not own their own home, they rent. Um, and not necessarily from some of the best landlords either. The one thing to note about the Hispanic Latino population, they tend to, again, as I said before, live generationally. So someone bought a house in 1940, there are people today who are still living in that same house or near that same house, okay? And I'm not going to go too deeply into this, but the social, the physical and social determinants of health are all based on, are, are all based on place for the most part. Where do you live? What do you have access to? Um, when you again look at that map and see, well, yeah, it, you know, 
if you go drive around these neighborhoods, you you will see there is a lack of. Now it is getting better in some situations. I live in Tennessee Town. I live right up the street from Grace Med. It's an awesome thing. I don't know. I kind of like the grocery store though. <laughs> I, I liked being able to walk to the grocery store as easily as I could um, go to that I can go to Grace Med now. Um, that that is a situation. Luckily, you know, the bus routes make things accessible, but if you're doing like real major grocery shopping because you've gotten either your WIC vouchers or your um or your your EBT card, um you can only take so many bags on the bus. So um you know, think about what's in the blue areas, you know, that pretty blue over there, you know, there, again, there are amenities and resources, there are grocery stores, you have access to shopping, you have access to recreational amenities that are new, they're, they're not old, they're new, um, you don't find that much, as much in the pink and the red areas, so, um, when we talk about the health of our citizens, we really do need to also consider that this system was created, you know, in the late 1930s and it is persisting today. So um, what are some of our options? What, what is the legacy, you know, and how do we break this cycle? So I, yeah, that's it. I, and I think I did pretty good, Carol, in 1241. I think we have time for questions. Yes, ma'am, you did. I yeah. See, uh, well, let's just open it up for questions. Um, Gretchen had a question a minute ago. Uh, and now I can't get to it. Gretchen, do you want to unmute and ask your question out loud? I'll see if I can bring it up and read it, Carol, since I wrote it and I have so many things going on in my brain. I really want to know about what's going on in Shawnee County since I recently moved back. Our loan rates, and I included home insurance rates also, still tied to the neighborhoods or zip codes in Kansas. And do deeds and covenants in Kansas still include exclusionary clauses like the ones you mentioned? Uh, to my knowledge, yes, they do still include in, in exclusionary clauses. Not all of them necessarily um, honor them. I know, I know there is a debate, a discussion in Kansas City in a blighted, in a quote blighted neighborhood that um, the owners wouldn't sell because of the exclusionary things. It's not as a big a deal to my knowledge in Topeka anymore. But yes, I've had a conversation with Bill Fyander and yeah, they're, they're still out there, but it depends on the owner whether they're gonna honor it or not. In turn, I can't answer the question about insurance, um, but I'm gonna assume that if you're considered a higher risk neighborhood that yes, your insurance rates are gonna be higher than everyone Yes, else. I, yeah. I moved from another state and an investigative reporter for a TV station researched that and found out areas were charged higher insurance, not only on their homes, but also on their autos. And their legislature took action within a year's time of the report coming out and made that an illegal practice. Okay. Good to know. Mary Galligan had asked, how does the health map relate to representation on the city council? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. Mary, can you clarify that for me, please? The question simply is, are the, um, does the health map reflect um, how the uh, how the city makes its policies uh, on the city council, and in in such a way that maybe unless those districts are redrawn properly, we can just expect more of the same because a lot some of the decisions at least are made locally. 
I don't even say theoretically it does, but I see that Michael Bell is in here and I'm gonna, uh, Michael is actually my NIA president um, and he's worked in the field for quite a while. So I'm gonna let Michael address that if that's okay with Michael. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that, that would be fine. Uh, yes, I'm Michael Bell. I'm the president of Tennessee Town NIA. Have been since 2014, have been involved in the NIA since 1996. Uh, regarding the representation of the city council, the city has 21 NIAs. Those are the low to moderate income neighborhoods of the city. And that's where you'll also find most of our communities of color in this city. And of those 21 NIAs, I think they are represented currently by five city council members. Roughly, you can put the boundary, the Topeka's Mason-Dixon line is roughly McVicker. Anything west of McVicker, you're not gonna find too many LMI people. Anything east of McVicker, uh, which includes of course, Central Topeka, Old North Topeka, Oakland, East Topeka, um, Southeast Topeka, uh, that's where you'll find uh, communities of color. And they'll be divided up amongst those five city council members, the first five districts. Correct. I agree with that. I guess I would put in that I, I think it is good that city of Topeka has district representation. If we did not uh, things would probably be more, more unbalanced. Other questions? Is this what you guys were expecting to hear today? Is anyone surprised by this information? Yeah, no. Feel free to speak. No, no it's. I, <laughs> But what I want to say is you sort of, you, it, it's, it, it's not shocking, but it's, the detail is very, is very helpful, the work you've done. Just the online history of what for today. Michael. Michael? Go ahead, Michael. Yeah, if I may, I guess, uh, and I've seen your presentation before, and it really was enlightening to me because I did not know about the connection between redlining in the 1930s and 40s and the neighborhood health maps. Now, of course, I mentioned earlier that I've been involved in Tennessee Town since 96. So I was around when those neighborhood health maps first came into existence in, I believe, 2004 or 2005. And at that point, uh, Tennessee Town was ra rated as uh, intensive care, which, of course, was... Uh, meant that we had uh, the most challenges uh, of all the neighborhoods. And so, you know, we've been working to try to get that improved. And right now we're majority at risk, which is one rung up. But I never uh, knew that there was that connection that basically those health maps were self-fulfilling prophecies of the redlining that happened in the city in the 30s and 40s. Mm -hmm. But yeah. given how racism works in our nation, I guess I shouldn't really have been all that surprised because it's all cumulative. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was kind of shocked when I started researching this, how you could simply just overlay the two maps and it was almost, you know, exactly the same boundary lines and you, and it, and it makes you wonder even in more detail, I mean, this is just an overview, but you have to realize that people are part of this system. People are part of this structure. So where were the advocates for those living in those neighborhoods? Why wasn't there, or maybe even today, why, what are the resources, the options um, to change this? I mean, we're talking about a system that's been in place for nearly 80 years, 80 years. So in our lifetimes, we've never known anything different. How can we reimagine, re-envision? I know there's kind of a movement to move away from the health maps, um, 
but I hope they still have a place in our conversation yeah, because they really do show, you know, a baseline. This is where we started and how far have we moved, you know, in this journey. Michael, did you have something else? Yeah, just real quickly on the health maps, and I've had this discussion quite frequently with uh, Bill Fiander, the planning director, and Dan Warner, who is uh, uh, the planning uh, member of the planning staff, uh, about um, the neighborhood maps. I have concerns. I think that uh, there really hasn't been a full-fledged assessment of that process since they came into being. Mm -hmm. And as we know, for any process to work, it needs to be assessed. Uh, intermittently. And so I think we do need to assess. I hope we keep it, but I think it does need to be assessed. I'll give you an example. Um, Tennessee Town historically has been a working class neighborhood. We embrace that. We don't run away from that. We're not trying to bring in higher income people. We're not trying to bring in fancy housing. We embrace our working class neighbors and welcome them. But what has happened with the neighborhood health map process, at least on that one component, is that we're being penalized for that because mm -hmm. we don't, we're not seeking to have the incomes rise. We're seeking to have good quality, affordable housing in a safe neighborhood for people who are low to moderate income because that is historically who we are. Right. So that's when I get on my social determinants of health bandwagon. I really feel like mm -hmm. if, you know, I, I would switch some of the things that they use to the criteria that are create the health maps, I would be looking more at the social determinants of health and creating that safe space that people can thrive in versus you're right, you know, just because especially now, all of a sudden, because of the pandemic and this crazy housing market, my house shot up in crazy value, but that doesn't necessarily mean that, that my neighborhood, you know, um, has changed that much. I, I, it, was, it was just so annoying. I, I, pro I protested. <laughs> I, and why? Oh, oh, Ryan has a question. Yeah. Yes. I, what what impact, and this should be for with you, Michael. In, do you see of increasing the minimum wage? Would that? Do you see that as having a positive impact in terms of and, and what, what Mr. Bell said was like, okay, this is a we're in working class neighborhoods, but raising the minimum wage. It seems to me that that would be a positive. I mean, we're not saying everybody makes five hundred thousand dollars a year and be investment bankers. We're talking about raising the minimum wage from seven dollars to fifteen. Is that would that have you seen that impact in other cities that that has made a difference? Donna Ray, I'll defer to you. Oh, raising them is that my preference? Yes, I believe that raising the minimum wage would is absolutely essential in this process. Um, at this point in time, and I can't quote the housing study off the top of my head, but the majority of Topeka, it even though if you live in a certain area, you're across that blue line, it's all good. It's all great, you know, but when you come back over, um, there are people living and poverty that do not need to be. There are systems and structures that we could change yes. so very easily yes. to increase affordable housing. There are systems and structures to, mm -hmm. you know, I go on a walk every single, mm -hmm. not every single morning, most mornings I go on a walk. Um, I am increasingly seeing houselessness. Mm -hmm. I, and I see houselessness next to an empty house. And I'm like, where is the disconnect going on here? How can we, and if, if it's about creating tax revenue, well, wouldn't it be better instead of demolishing that house, figuring out how to fix that house so yes. someone who is living on the street could then have some place to live? I mean, it, it, it's mind boggling and I have no real answers for that. I just have like soapbox opinions that I will get up and stand on, so. 
That's where we start. Well, what I'm, I'm, I think of Medicaid expansion too. I mean, they, yep. that's another just basic. Right, right. You know, I, 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 I'll be very blunt. I currently still have my job because I need access to health care. <laughs> you know, um, and I'm wondering how many other people would be saying the same yeah. thing, you mm -hmm. know, um, yeah. and if I am understanding that, you know, those jobs, there are some jobs that do not offer and people do not have options. Again, Grace Med is a beautiful thing, uh, even though I probably do not qualify for free services. I still go there because I feel like it's supporting their energy and effort in other ways. I it's like almost I'm making a donation to the stability of this organization in my neighborhood because I know it's needed. So I that's where I choose my to get the majority of my health care, my primary care from. But um, but that's a conscious decision on my part. Um, and I think we all have to start making better conscious decisions. And again, soapbox, just feel free to tell me <laughs> to get down anytime. We like it. We have one more question. John Ray, thank you so much. And it is pretty eye-opening to look at how history is stacked upon us right now. Mary Robin has a hand up if she needs it. Yeah, it's um, definitely when you look for the pattern, um, it's there and we have to address it in some way, shape or form, or how do they, how do they say it? we're just doomed to re keep repeating it, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, visitors. Thank you for attending today. See you in person in September. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you.